outrage over Chicago's plans to close more than 50 public schools, most of them in poor and minority neighborhoods. What motivated the city's decision? And what will it mean for the tens of thousands of students who will be forced to relocate? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. I'm Shihab Rutansi. Chicago's mayor says the closures are tough but necessary in order to deal with a $1 billion deficit and what he called underutilized schools. He also says the change is necessary to provide students with a better education. A lot of anguish, and I understand that, and I appreciate it. But the anguish and the pain that comes from not making the change, from not making, from making the change, is less, or minimal, in my view, or pales, compared to the anguish that comes by trapping children in schools that are not succeeding, and trapping children in schools that will not give them the opportunity. But an analysis by the Chicago Sun Times shows that just one third of students will be sent to schools that are deemed to be better performing and the majority of the school closures will be taking place in poor minority neighborhoods, prompting critics, including the Chicago Teachers Union, to call the policy, quote, classist and racist. And while Chicago's may be the largest wave of school closures in U.S. history, it's not alone. The cities of Philadelphia, Detroit, Newark, and Washington, D.C. have all announced similar plans. And joining us from Chicago is Michael Klonsky. He's the national director of the Small Schools Workshop, a consulting firm helping school districts create smaller learning institutions. G2 Brown also joins us from Chicago. He's an education organizer at the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. And here in the studio, we're joined by Jason Richwine, a senior analyst at the Heritage Foundation specializing in education policy. Michael Klonsky, first of all, before we get on to some of the other issues, what effect is it thought these school closures will have on the neighborhoods uh, in which they're happening? Well, you know, these, these closings have, targeted, uh, have been targeted for uh, some of the most uh, depressed and resource-starved communities, uh, almost all in African-American communities with uh, high unemployment rates, a lot of uh, high crime areas. And uh, when, you, when you shut down schools, in those communities, which are often the anchor of the communities, uh, it increases the blight and, the, and a lot of the social problems in the, in the community. So it's a, it's a big issue uh, in terms of uh, uh, neighborhood and community issues aside from the educational uh, problems it causes. Right. I mean, and just to focus on, on those neighborhood and community issues for a bit longer, G2 Brown, it also um, needs to be put in the context of local gang boundaries, which is something that I think a lot of our viewers w won't necessarily understand. But can you help us understand what impact it's going to have in, in that area? Absolutely. Um, in Chicago, uh, there used to be maybe four major gangs. Um, and these gangs, while not positive by any means, uh, were often led by adults, uh, had certain rules uh, where uh, you know, schools were often safe grounds, and you didn't see a lot of mingling between people that happened to be in gangs, which is not most of our young people, but uh, some that, that you didn't see the mingling because they went to different schools in different neighborhoods. But now, uh, because of the dismantling of the Gangster Disciples, the Blackstone Rangers, and the Vice Lords, these, now these gangs are really like cliques. Uh, on every other block, there's a different gang, and the leadership is between 15 and 18 years old. So there are no rules now. So a young person walking three blocks to a school, does, it is putting their life in danger. You cannot have enough safety patrols to address that issue. The, the, I think Mr. Klonsky brought up a good point, that community infrastructure is what we need. The basic institutions that are supposed to meet the needs of the people have to be examined, addressed, and improved. Uh, and you can't improve the lot of a community by disinvesting in the major institutions that are supposed to serve them. 
All right, so, so, that's exactly right. so uh, Jason Richwine, nonetheless, though, despite what could potentially be enormous, enormous social impact, uh, Mayor uh, Emanuel has gone down this route. A lot hinges then on this conception of there being underutilized schools, which could somehow all be rationalized, and you can put you know, the, the students from other schools into, into other schools nearby and so forth. Can you perhaps explain this concept of underutilization? Sure. I mean, I would start by saying that, you know, if, if we're going to let gangs dictate education policy in Chicago, I think the city has some pretty severe problems that go beyond education. Because you don't want to exacerbate the problems is the point, isn't it? That's right. That's yeah. right. But the schools themselves are not performing very well in the first place. So to call it a community institution, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. But look, the point here, though, is that the schools have a fiduciary responsibility to uh, provide education in a cost-effective way. And if they're not doing it in a cost-effective way, and I think it's fairly clear that that's the case, you know, that they have a responsibility to, uh, you know, reallocate resources in a way that's, that's most efficient. Cost-effective meaning what exactly? Well, you, you have to provide a given level of education for a, a certain cost. You want to minimize that cost for that given level. Uh, Michael Klonsky, may, what, what do you make of this, this definition sorry, of underutilization and cost-benefit? Yes, go ahead first, you two. I, 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 think I, think you, I think this is G G2 Brown ahead. first, ahead, and then, then Michael Klonsky. I'm sorry. G2, go that's first. That's fine. Go ahead, G2. Respectfully, I would, I would say that's, that's inaccurate, and it's, it's insulting to some degree. And the reason I would say it's inaccurate is because there's a perception, and, and a lot of it is institutionalized racism. There's a perception that our schools are just horrible. Uh, but I can give you several examples of high-performing neighborhood schools in some of the worst neighborhoods. Um, I worked with a school called Melville Fuller on the south side of Chicago. When we first began working with that school, the only 9% of the students met or exceeded state standards. A uh, new principal came in, active local school council, we provided wraparound supports for students, and the school became a CPS rising star school. Arnie Duncan himself used to bring people to Fuller and say, this is how you transform a neighborhood school. The question that we have to ask, and, and, and it's a, a question of courage, what is the response of the school district when our schools improve? The response to Melville Fuller was to make it a receiving school for school closings, to bring 225 children into the school and the resources didn't follow those children. And so the school was absolutely destabilized. And we have to deal with the world as it is, not as we wish it be, because we don't have to deal with the consequences. The researchers, the Mayor Rahm Emanuel does not have to deal with the consequences of going to a funeral because a young man was shot because he was 16 years old living in another neighborhood. What should be happening is the same thing that happens in, in, in affluent communities where the municipality, not the people, the municipality makes sure that the basic institutions meet the needs of the people. They make sure they're good schools, they make sure they're good grocery stores, they make sure they're good hospitals, they make sure there's good, good uh, 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 institutions that meet the needs of the people to attract a certain population, where the exact opposite happens in our communities, where you can close police stations, you can close trauma centers, you can shut down schools by following numbers but not recognizing that it's the institutions in the community that help shape the lives and the quality of life of the people who live right. in the community. M Michael so Klonsky. that's not accurate, what the gentleman is saying. Michael Konsky, I mean, is, is there that sense that this is actually going to exacerbate problems of education, even in schools then, which were showing improvements because, because class sizes are going to have to increase, for example? Well, uh, not only that, but I, I don't think the gentleman from the Heritage Foundation knows the first thing about those schools or whether they're cost effective or not. You know, uh, it's time that we stop looking at schools like uh, uh, clothing stores or like uh, Starbucks. You know, uh, uh, w if you, if you want to know if a school's doing well, you have to uh, get into that school and look at how it's serving the children. And if there are problems in a school, you have to put more resources into that school and give more support for the teachers, especially those that are teaching the neediest kids. Closing down the school and moving kids across uh, uh, different territories in the city, uh, separating them from their teachers, it, it basically destabilizes even further the lives of these children. And then as G2 Brown said, uh, you're, you're bringing them into receiving schools that are going to mean overcrowded classrooms in those schools. Now they're talking about class size in the receiving schools being between 30 and 40 students per class. And as an educator, right. uh, I can tell you that that's a potential disaster waiting to happen. These kids, uh, you know, from my experience in the small schools workshop, we get to have smaller, more personalized uh, learning environments. And when somebody says a school is underutilized, I would say, uh, 
why is it underutilized? I mean, one of the reasons it's underutilized is that they've, uh, we're driving so many poor people out of the city, you know, with the, with the closing of public housing and moving uh, people out to the suburbs and then trying to attract the new uh, middle class and professional class back into the city. And we're creating a two-tier school system uh, for them. In other words, uh, creating uh, selective enrollment schools and privately run charter schools and uh, leaving the majority of the poorest and neediest kids in uh, overcrowded schools with large classrooms. And I think that's just the opposite right. of what we should be doing. Jason Richwan, a lot, a lot there to, to unpack. Sure. I mean, first of all, when it comes to education, this shouldn't just be about shifting children around on a spreadsheet. But secondly, is this really about education or is this about various other issues from the dogma that seems to have taken hold about charter schools and the private sector being better than the public sector, as well as perhaps some kind of social engineering about and gentrification in, in some of these areas? Uh, look, uh, there's no yeah, well, conspiracy that, you know, here. Uh, there, there's no conspiracy. I mean, well, in Chicago, in Chicago, in Chicago, they're, in Chicago yeah. they're privatizing everything public. We'll get know. back to you in a second. They sold off the Skyway. Right. They sold off the Skyway. They sold off the parking meters. They sold anything that's not nailed down in right. the city. They're privatizing Michael. and. Uh, yeah. Can and, we, can and, we uh, Jason? Big problem. Problem. Okay, Jason, the, the, the purpose of the school closures is to reallocate resources in order to help the students that need it most. That's the whole point of it. Uh, what Michael talks about, adding resources to fix schools. Uh, the link between resources and student achievement is not very strong. We've been increasing resources for 30 years. I haven't seen a lot of improvement. Uh, class size reduction in particular is something that I think uh, has a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, class size reduction as a general policy does not help students learn more. There are certain certain students, certain circumstances that where right. students can benefit under, from uh, under deprived uh, uh, in, or deprived children in, in certain cases. In, especially but, in early but for ages, the typical yeah. student, it's it's not a policy that, that, is, that is uh, particularly cost effective. I mean, think about the cost That's actually involved true. in reducing classes. You have to hire more teachers. You have to furnish new classrooms. You have to build new school buildings. In some cases, is extremely expensive. What we should do actually find the best teachers and actually increase the class sizes there to make sure as many students and as possible. That, what research is that based on? Oh, that's, that's based on, on uh, what we know about teacher effectiveness. We, we can identify the teachers that do very well right. uh, in terms of helping students. With all due respect, this gentleman doesn't know the first there. thing about teaching and, then, and learning. Well, hang on a second, Michael. Accurate. If I, may, I, may I say something? It, it, can we just let uh, Jason finish okay. his thought, and then, then I'll let you both. The more students yes, you sir. get in a yes, classroom with, with a very good teacher, you, you potentially maximize how much is learned there. In some cases, That's not, not all. That's not true. And what I'm There's talking no about research is, to support what that. What I'm talking about is data based on the economics. I think you'll hear a lot of anecdotes from the other two guests. I'm talking about the data, what ec economists actually look at when they look at studies of class size reduction, for example. Uh, okay, this gentleman Brown doesn't first. know the first thing can, about education may, research. May G2 Brown, then Michael Klonsky, but first G2. Okay, so respectfully, I, I would say that closing schools in Chicago is not new. When people say we have to do something, and that's what you hear from Barbara Burr Bennett, that's what you hear from Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Understanding in Chicago since 2002 they've been doing something. Approximately 105 schools have been closed. That's almost the size of the Baltimore School District. So it is, it is, it is larger than the Pittsburgh, <laughs> the entire city of Pittsburgh School District. And here's what we know. Here's what the research says. Chicago Catalyst Magazine, December 7, 2011, reported that since 2002, only 18% of the schools that have replaced closed schools are high performing. Of that 18%, half are selective enrollment. So despite right. having the, the selective enrollment uh, mechanisms such as lotteries and just out and out students have to apply to get into the school, despite using zero tolerance policies such as pushing young people out, who may not make your portfolio look attractive. The, the, the reforms in Chicago have failed. In New Orleans, where they've privatized the entire school system, where 90% of the schools are charter schools, but 79% of them receive a D or an F grade. In, in New York, under Bloomberg, despite 10 years of these same types of policies, only 13% of African-American Latino children are graduating college and career ready. I think what we have to do is remove the shell game from all of this. What you have in Chicago is a two-tiered education system. I'll give you a good example. Lakeview High School, two blocks from Mayor Rahm Emanuel's house, about 18% white enrollment. At Lakeview High School, they have 12 advanced placement classes, different courses. Diet High School, 99% low income, about 98% African American. They have no advanced placement classes. At Lakeview, they have Mandarin Chinese, German, French, Spanish, regular honors and advanced placement. 
At Diet High School, they have regular Spanish one and two. And I can go on and on. Right. In Lakeview, but they had, isn't that partly about the funding of schools, though, GT? I mean, there, there, there is that no, sense that, that no, it's that's, not. It's, it's know, actually the, about priorities, and and that's that's the piece but, I want to raise. If, if schools are funded through property taxes, though, then I mean, isn't it, shouldn't this be a more profit, a more yeah. constructive way to look at things, perhaps, and say, well, look, obviously you're not going to get these schools funded because the, the entire funding mechanism, um, Michael Klonsky, is no, completely skewed in the first place. That's not accurate, sir. You're absolutely. That's not accurate. You're right about one thing. <laughs> you're right about one thing. The funding mechanism is is inequitable. The reliance on property taxes to fund public schools is an inequitable uh, process. It's an inequitable system. So that might be a good but starting G2 point for the mayor, is, I suppose. Is, is the point then? But, you, you know. Yes, but what G two is but, 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 but G two is making a, that, a, a, an important point here. But yeah, G two is making an important that. point here. Uh, even with, with the funding that we get is also distributed inequitably. And Absolutely. I think he's making a good point. Right. A good point about that. Could, so we I have two finish. problems. Yeah. yeah All right, you, you, sorry, finish your thought. Then obviously, obviously, I, I was on the. Uh, I didn't quite no, get no. it. No, no. And see, it's important to look at this because we off, when we talk about education, we look at spreadsheets, but we don't look at legacy. We don't look at history. We don't look at how how. Yes, there's been hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars flooded into education and working in low-income communities. But what has happened with that is that that funding has been connected to punitive school measures such as school probation. Right. When, a, when a school gets on probation, the, the principal, the teachers, the local school council loses basically all authority. And the decisions at that school from the curriculum to the professional development to uh, uh, the, the block schedule in the school is determined by the district. In Chicago, we're, se we're separated into networks, and the networks are the ones that make the final decision. So what you have is money flooded into a particular philosophy of education that right. is proven not to work. And so what, we, what should be happening is that since Brown versus the Board of Education, we should not have a school system in the United States where one neighborhood has one quality of education and one has another. You're not just looking at funding, you're looking at an issue of expectations. Right. You're looking at an issue of higher expectations for one set of people and lower from another. J Jason, Jason, Jason Richwine, then, I mean, the, the system is skewed against so these neighborhoods and it's, it's partly skewed uh, intentionally in order to push a particular ideological line and perhaps various other issues is what I seem to be hearing. Yeah. I, again, I think. Can I, can I just say one no, thing? We better get <laughs> Jason to have a word. I think the, again, the, right. what's what's being discussed here about funding and the link between the amount of funding and student achievement is a very popular misconception. It's especially popular on the left to hear people say it. If only we spent more money, the schools would be better. More money for schools. More money for schools. We hear it over and over again. We've been increasing school That's spending not what for I'm a saying. long, long I'm not time. Saying more I, money I understand for you school. want to spend it in certain ways, but I, I want to make the point that you know Washington D.C., for example, where where I am right now, uh, spends almost thirty thousand dollars per pupil and also has one of the lowest achieving uh, school districts in the entire nation. It's not about money. What I think you want to do here, and again, there's no silver <laughs> bullet. There's no silver bullet. I, I, I fully acknowledge that there's no, no, there's it's no always, solution. It's always the people with money fix. who say it's not about money. Isn't that funny? Actually, if you look at the, uh, the per pupil spending divided by race, for example, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, it's about the same nationwide. Well, it shouldn't be the same. I mean, we had a blue ribbon panel that just came out last month actually saying, no, the, the point is it shouldn't be the same. You should actually be spending more again, on deprived areas, it, actually. Uh, it, 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 it assumes a link between spending and actual achievement that just isn't there. Well, I mean, that's really the lots problem. Of studies that suggest that there are, but Michael Klonsky, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I belong to a, a group called CREATE. It's, a, it's an area-wide uh, group of researchers and uh, academics throughout the Chicago area who've been studying this issue of school closings for the past year. And it's interesting that he brought up Washington, D.C. When, when they closed schools in Washington, D.C., they said it was going to save uh, the taxpayers uh, millions of dollars. It ended up costing 40 million more in money. Uh, now they're talking about the same thing with Chicago. Uh, now we estimate that th the closing of these 61 buildings is going to end up costing the taxpayers some a billion dollars more, not saving them. So anything. hang on. So it doesn't improve and education, cost, and, it, and it's more expensive, is what you're saying. It doesn't improve and, and, education, and, 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 and it's more expensive. Exactly. Now wait. I want to make one. I want to make one more point. Uh, yes, sir. I want to make one more point here. Uh, Th this, uh, this stuff about uh, don't throw money at it. I mean, Illinois as a state has had the biggest reduction th in uh, school funding of any state in the United States. It's hit Chicago the hardest. 
that's one of the reasons people are so trying so desperately to figure out how to keep these schools afloat. Uh, the state is bankrupt. Uh, uh, the inequities in funding relying on pr property taxes is, is crazy because we're not taxing the big corporations in this city at all. I mean, co uh, companies like Boeing, who have their headquarters here, don't pay a nickel in, in state taxes. It's ridiculous. And uh, that's mm -hmm. led to an imbalance uh, where the, as, as the economic crisis deepens, they try to put the whole burden on teachers, on public employees, on public schools. And that's why you have the selling off and the privatizing of uh, schools, hospitals, uh, uh, maintenance, garbage collection, selling off the skyway, selling off the parking meters. And now that's like a triple tax on people. Uh, they, in, right. in our neighborhood, they've closed the last remaining mental health clinics in the city, and now they're talking about closing 61 schools on the road to maybe 200 more. I mean, this kind of a That's plan right. is, is right. it's, so, it's uh, like uh, the austerity. Gigi, we'll come to you in a second, but right let Jason answer some of those points. I mean, that, that's the other point then. Rahm Emanuel is looking in the wrong direction here. Why not look at a more equitable tax structure for a start, tax those who exactly are more well right. off as opposed to people in well, poor well, can areas? Can I ask Mr. It's, Rich it's, then it's, to answer one question from me? Gigi, we'll come to you can in a second. Mr. It's, it's a Jason. classic thing oh, we hear okay. over and over again uh, from, from the and people on that And this model isn't working is the key one, though, because again, they have the statistics on their side about education attainment and indeed what effect it's had on the budget deficit. You can find it all. All on create uh, on okay. create Chicago so, at blogspot.com. So what we're hearing again is, is raise right taxes, raise yeah. more taxes, raise and, at least and some and taxes. More I think in the, in the case yeah, of raise taxes, spend yeah. more money, spend more money, and we'll see how things work out. Hasn't worked out uh, so far. Now regarding the cost benefit analysis, look, anyone can do a cost benefit analysis. Maybe maybe your guess is the one that's correct, but obviously the mayor disagrees. That's why he's closing the schools in this first place. Well, that's an interesting. There, point. Is, there is no conspiracy. I want to want to <laughs> emphasize that it seems like your other two guests keep alleging a conspiracy against minority schools or low-income schools. That's ridiculous. And, Nobody and said that. And that's not what's going Nobody on right that. here. The mayor is acting may, in good faith to try to improve may, schools. They're alleging an ideological it, belief may, system may that's been proven to be, they suggest, wrong through the empirical evidence. Well, well, why would the mayor ignore that empirical evidence? I mean, here's well, that's a good question. G2 Brown, okay. I mean, that's what's so interesting. I mean, these are Democrats doing this, right? It's the Obama administration Whoa, who's pushing right. it, and it's Rahm Emanuel. I, I, I will say this. Yeah. I, I will say this, and I, and I don't mean any insult, but I will say this. I'm, I'm, don't place me on the left or place me on the right. right. Place me as someone who lives in a neighborhood that, is, that has experienced massive disinvestment, that has worked with young people for years, worked with parents for years, has actually worked in schools that have dramatically improved, and then watched the district uh, uh, torpedo the progress in those schools. So I don't speak from a, a particular ideology. I'm speaking from on the ground right. experience. Uh, uh, and so I would just say this, that what I would like uh, uh, Mr. Bridgeson to address is the p statistic I gave before about the percentage of schools that are doing well, and these include charter and contract schools. And then I'd also like to address this. You know, in Chicago, after the first six years of the creation of local school councils, which is backed by most credible research that, lo that, that local site management works the best, uh, there were six straight years of improved test scores on the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. And then in 1995, the Illinois legislature gave the mayor control of the schools in, this, in the city of Chicago. In 17 years of mayoral control, the, the scores on the NAEP exam have basically flatlined. The achievement gap between black and white students has increased. And what we know that in Chicago, nationally, not just in Chicago, only one in five charter schools are high performing. Four out of five are doing the same or worse than public schools. We also know and this is a fact that was in the credo study from Stanford University. We also know that uh, on the NAEP exam, charter schools are outperformed by neighborhood schools and the percentage of children that exceed state standards in reading and in math, which basically is an indicator of who would do well in college. So what I would like so my so that's what I would like to do is address what the research, the return research is saying about the, the, these That's reforms. Right. I, I don't mean, think he, he's seconds, not looking Jason, at the I mean, data. These, these okay. statistics, the empirical evidence seems overwhelming. The system doesn't work. That's being pushed by Rahm Emanuel. Well, I think the system has to be given a chance to work. We, it what has charter 10 schools years, do, years or so, doesn't they, it? they give you flexibility. <laughs> they give yeah. you a chance to That's experiment. 17 years what certainly does not control. work is the traditional public school system, which has been a failure for a long time. Jason Richwine, thank you very much. G2 true. Brown, thank you. Michael Klonsky, thank you very much, too. Thank you for having us. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.